Hey everyone, Azim here. This is chapter eight, starting on slide 15. It's our final video for chapter eight. We are going over the tarsal bones and bones of the feet. There are seven tarsal bones. Sounds like carpal, but carpal is in the wrist, tarsal is in your ankles. Uh, so there are eight carpal bones, there are seven tarsal bones. Some of these are pretty large. The, Distal ones are smaller. Uh, we will go over this mnemonic in a minute. When I show you these bones in complete anatomy, it'll be easier to see. Uh, the metatarsals are the bones on the sole of your feet. Just like you have metacarpals in the palm of your hand, metatarsals are the bones of the sole of your feet, the plantar region. Um, and then you have phalanges. We call them phalanges in your, in your hands. There's also phalanges in your feet. Phalanges of the hand are your fingers. Phalanges of the feet are your toes. You have to obviously distinguish which one you're talking about. Phalanges of the manual region or phalanges of the pedal region. Like before, phalanges is plural. If you want to refer to just one, it's phalanx. The segmentation that we had on our hands is great for picking things up. We can kind of walk on our hands. Some people can do it better than others, I'm sure. Um, but mostly for dexterity. With our feet, the segmentation is great for support and distributing weight. We have segmentation to make our feet pliable and adapted to uneven ground. We can support our body weight. We can act, it can act as a lever when we're walking to push forward or other directions. Um, it's concave on the plantar surface, just like it's concave on our palmar surface, it's concave on our plantar surface because that curvature provides a lot of support. The naming convention is the same as what we saw in our hands. Instead of pollux, pollux is thumb, because pollux is by the palm. Hallux is by the heel. Hallux is your big toe. And so hallux gets the Roman numeral one. Then two, three, four, five is your pinky toe. Metatarsal one, two, three, four, five. Proximal phalanx one distal phalanx one, there is no middle phalanx one. There's no such thing as a middle phalanx one. So for the hallux, there's a distal and a proximal. For two through five, there's distal, middle, and proximal. We'll look at this more in a minute in complete anatomy. The metatarsals and phalanges together form a curvature and these curvatures form the arches of our feet. And the arches of our feet are really important for proper support and weight distribution. If you're a runner or have feet that are too flat or feet that are too arched, you know that you might need some special support, special orthotics, special shoes to help you walk better that will put less strain on your joints, put less strain on your muscles. There are actually three arches that your feet form because your feet are three-dimensional, not just two-dimensional. If you look along the medial side, the medial side, take a look at this medial view over here, formed by the calcaneus, talus, navicular, medial cuneiform, metatarsal number one, and your phalanges number one, the the hallux, that forms your medial longitudinal arch. Medial longitudinal arch is on the medial side. Medial longitudinal arch is here, here in this picture down here, in this bottom of the foot, it's from A to C. On the lateral side, we have the lateral longitudinal arch. You can see that down here. That involves a calcaneus, cuboid, 
metatarsal five, phalanx five. On our picture over here, it's going from B to C. That's your lateral longitudinal arch. And then connecting A to B, connecting across, that's your transverse arch, which you can see over here as well. Your transverse arch. Forms a triangle. Triangles have a lot of stability. Altogether, these three arches, when shaped in just the right way, provide a lot of support. Too flat, uh, too flat art, too flat of an arch can cause your joints to go in directions that they're not meant to go in. There could be twisting, oops. There could be twisting, which puts more stress on joints, which puts more stress on muscles and can cause lots of problems. Whether it's too flat or too high, those are irregular arches and that can cause overall problems with weight distribution. It could be easier to sprain a ligament, uh, cause plantar fasciitis, cause uh, inflammation of the fascia at the bottom of your feet, among other problems. All I want you to know for the purpose of this class is that by not having the proper arch, just like with our back, by not having the proper arch, we don't have proper weight distribution, which causes problems elsewhere in our body. When you have problems in one place, that will lead to other problems in other places because everything's connected. If you have problems with your, with your uh, lower back, for instance, that leads to problems in your hip, which leads to problems in your knee, which leads to problems in your ankle or vice versa. It's all connected. If you have problems with your posture, that puts different loads on your ankles or vice versa. Um, once again, it's all connected. And hopefully you're thinking about your posture right now. Um, overall, I, if you're asking me for advice, overall, the best thing you can do is strengthen your muscles. I don't mean become a bodybuilder. I mean, work on even the littlest muscles. We, we often think that we gotta work the big muscles up all the time. It's really the little muscles that are overlooked working on stabilization muscles, working on range of movement muscles. And that can help you improve your posture, improve uh, areas of joint pain. We'll look at complete anatomy in a second, but I just wanted to recap of why, of, of what we started with. We looked at uh, this question, shoulders location is common. It's common because if you uh, remember what the shape of the humerus is, the head of the humerus is not that big and the glenoid fossa is very shallow. You have a really shallow glenoid fossa. Compare that with the head of the femur and the acetabulum of the coxal bone, a much deeper socket that's way more stable. And form follows function. It's a shallow socket. It's not stable, not as stable, but we have a high degree of movement. Our hips, our femoroacetabular joint, not as flexible on average compared to our glenohumeral joint, our shoulder joint, but it's more stable. So there's trade-offs. As I've been saying, there's always a trade-off when, you, when you're better at one thing, you're not gonna be as good as the other thing. So there's trade-offs here between our shoulder and hip joints. Let's take a look at complete anatomy. So we need to look at the bones of the ankle and go over that mnemonic. From this view, I'm going to hide the, um, you can see the, uh, the tibia. Here's the right tibia. It fits in really nicely with the talus. I'm going to hide that too, actually. Whoops, maybe not. 
What I just uh, hid and what I'm gonna show again is the talus. Okay, there's our talus. The talus is on top. It articulates with the tibia and the, and the fibula. The talus is on top. Hiding underneath, and you can see it better over here actually, on the left side. This is the calcaneus. Calcaneus is underneath. It's the biggest of the tarsal bones. It's your heel bone. Talus is on top, calcaneus is below and posterior. It's your heel bone. This bone here, this is the navicular. Oops, sorry, not that one. There we go. Talus is, let me draw it since it's not cooperating. This is the talus. The navicular is here, there we go. Navicular, when I hear the word navicular, I think of Navy, Navy uses boats. It's kind of shaped like a boat. It's kind of shaped like a boat. And where do boats sail? They sail on the seas. All of these bones here start with the letter C or have a major letter C in them. These three C's here, these are all cuneiform bones. The word cuneiform means wedge shaped. They're wedge shaped kind of. <laughs> the one most medial, the one on the side of the hallux, that's the medial cuneiform. And then you have the intermediate cuneiform. And then you have the lateral cuneiform, medial intermediate lateral cuneiform bones. The lateral cuneiform is not the most lateral bone. The, the most lateral bone is the cuboid. Talus, calcaneus, navicular, medial cuneiform, intermediate cuneiform, lateral cuneiform, cuboid. The mnemonic that I was showing earlier is tiger, cubs, need milk, M-I-L, and instead of a K, it's a C, medial, intermediate, lateral, cuboid. Tiger cubs need milk. That's another way you can remember it. I kind of like my talus is top and navicular sailing on the seas. That also helps, I think, I feel. Let me give you a different view. Looking at the right ankle. You can see how the tibia and the fibula fit in really nicely with the talus. The tibia and fibula fit in really nicely with the talus. Ooh, okay. <clears throat> you can see the calcaneus is very big. Calcaneus is very big. This is a lateral view of the left foot. Mm -hmm. 
distal to the calcaneus is a cuboid or lateral. And then we get the meta tarsal five and four. From an inferior view, whoop, on the plantar side, we can see the calcaneus much better, more of it, kind of strong heel. Most lateral, largest one on the, of the distal tarsal bones is the cuboid. And then you've got the lateral cuneiform, intermediate cuneiform, medial cuneiform, navicular, and talus is on top. When we're looking at the, the hallux, remember there's only a proximal phalanx of the hallux and a distal phalanx of the hallux. There is no middle. One last thing I'll also point out here, we haven't named these bones, but do you see these two small things? Those are sesamoid bones. The largest sesamoid bone, the one that I asked you to know is the one in the patella, the V patella it is the sesamoid bone, but there are also really tiny sesamoid bones at certain places like your, um, like your hallux to allow for, for uh, better, um, more pulley-like motions at these joints. Fun fact. All right, those are bones of the ankle and feet as a whole. And some bones are missing here, but uh, yeah, I hope this was helpful. Please, uh, while you've watched this, please also watch my other videos where I show the siding of the different bones. When I say siding, I mean how to figure out anterior from posterior, superior from inferior or proximal from distal, medial side from lateral side. And then if, if, if there are two bones, how do you figure out the right bone from the left bone? Everything that I just said are completely different things. And sometimes the right and left bone to figure out left from right takes a bit of processing. You have to put things just so and then figure out which side is where. I go through that in those other videos. I hope this was helpful. Let me know if there are parts that I can explain, clarify, uh, leave questions in the comments and um, talk to me later, all right? Message me. Have a good day. I'll see you in chapter nine.